This video will explore a really interesting paper, Learning to Execute, on the power of sequence-to-sequence -sequence encoder-decoder long short-term memory networks to predict the output of Python programs which perform addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division with structures such as if statements or for loops. In addition to an interesting problem covered in this paper, this paper explores the role of curriculum learning. Curriculum learning is a really exciting and deep learning which has been used in OpenAI's Rubik's Cube Solver through automatic domain randomization, amongst many other recent advancements in AI and deep learning. This video will present their results with four different curriculum learning techniques. Not using a curriculum and only sampling from the target hard sample distribution, using a curriculum of progressively difficult programs, sampling from a distribution of easy and hard samples uniformly, and the best performing strategy, which uses a combination of sampling from the schedule of progressively growing uh, difficult samples and randomly sampling from the easy and hard sample distribution. I was motivated to explore this paper after reading Lillian Wang's latest blog post on curriculum for reinforcement learning, which I highly recommend and is linked in the description of this video. This video will present the paper, Learning to Execute. This paper tackles a really interesting problem of using sequence-to-sequence -sequence encoder-decoder LSTMs to predict the output of a Python program. The recurrent network takes this Python program in character by character, so taking in J equals 8, and is trained to produce the output that you would get from running this block of code. In addition to an interesting problem, this paper explores the role of curriculum learning in this setting, and different strategies of presenting programs to a randomly initialized LSTM. Interestingly, they find that a combination of sampling from a structured, easy to hard curriculum, measured by the length of the digits that they're uh, doing the adding, multiplication, etc. on, as well as the um, level of nesting the operations, defines this easy to hard curriculum. And they find that sampling from a structured, easy to hard curriculum, as well as randomly difficult programs, works better than no curriculum or either by themselves. In this video, we'll explore their experiments and explore the definition of curriculums and how this uh, improves their training. This slide gives a high level overview of modeling these programs character by character with sequence to sequence RNNs. The idea of the sequence to sequence framework is having an encoder and a decoder. And the idea of the recurrent neural networks is to have this input hidden cell state that goes to the next input as well as the input and then do this to encode the input sequence, in this case the Python program, and then have the decoder, which is taking the output and going in to do this kind of a decoding. In learning to execute, the authors use a long short-term memory architecture for their recurrent neural network in the sequence-to-sequence -sequence encoding or decoder framework. So I quickly wanted to walk through Chris Ola's blog post, Understanding LSTM Networks, it's linked in the description of this video, to talk about how the long short-term memory network uh, passes information to update the cell state, produce outputs, as well as how this relates to the sequence-to-sequence -sequence kind of encoder-decoder framework. So usually an LSTM network has this structure of having these four different gates to uh, have information flow through the cell and update the intermediate hidden state with respect to the previous hidden state, the previous output, and the previous input. But in the case of encoder-decoder, we don't always have like an input in the decoder and we don't always have a previous output in the encoder. So with the encoder, it's uh, encoding the Python program character by character, but it doesn't produce like an output after every encoding of the Python program. So that's a slight difference between the regular LSTM and the LSTM and the sequence to sequence architecture that I thought might be interesting to talk about. The programs modeled in this paper, Learning to Execute, focus on Python programs that include things like for loops, uh, comparisons, and having this addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, in order to produce the output. They also test these ideas of input doubling and reversing as these baselines for testing the long short-term memory networks. So in this case, you would have this input and the idea of doubling it would be to memorize the input and produce it again, which is a hard task if you think about uh, kind of the way that the LSTM has to have this kind of a memory in order to incorporate in its uh, hidden cell state this knowledge of the previous numbers it's seen. And then it also has reversing where it takes in the sequence and then it produces it back in reverse. So two other interesting problems that are tested in addition to the uh, Python program modeling. The role of curriculum learning in this paper, Learning to Execute, is describing the difficulty of modeling these Python programs based on the length of the digits and the nesting. So for example, it's easier to model say 8 plus 3 than it is the model 8,584 plus 7,567. The idea of nesting is how many expressions have to be uh, like nested in this kind of way. So in, the, in this example, you would have to do uh, J equals 8,584 8, uh, plus 920 times 8 uh, plus 1,500 and then plus 7,567. So you have three nested expressions in that case. And in this case, you have, you know, the three nested expressions of 8,827 minus 5,347 plus this and then doing this comparison. So you see how the number of operations 
describing the nesting. I mean, well, the, kind of the dependency as well is important for nesting. Describing the way that, you know, how challenging the memory is to store this program and evaluate it. In the paper, the authors explore four different strategies for curriculum learning. The first of which is the baseline with no curriculum, generating all the training samples with length equals A and nesting equals B, where A and B are the final target for the uh, program modeling. So one interesting thing they note in their paper about this first strategy of no curriculum is that it has this idea of the statistical learning theory where you're sampling from the same underlying data distribution in the training set as the testing set. So that's kind of one way of looking at these problems is it has the same distribution, but as we're seeing with curriculum learning, it helps to originally sample the training distribution from a different underlying di distribution as the test set, which will make more sense as uh, we explore more curriculum learning. So then the next uh, strategy is naive curriculum learning. In that paper from uh, Bengio et al. in 2009, the idea of just having a progressively challenging uh, curriculum. So the idea here is begin with length equals one and nesting equals one. Then once the learning saturates, you increase the length by one and then continue until you get to length equals A, then increment nesting to two and so on up to the final target. The next idea is a mixed strategy. So the mixed strategy just says uh, randomly sample from the difficulty, pick a random length from one to A and a random nesting from one to B. So mixed strategy is different from no curriculum because um, no curriculum would never explore something like length equals one and nesting equals one. It will rather just only sample from the uh, final target. And then you have combined strategy, which every training case is obtained by sampling from the naive curriculum, where you have this uh, progressive structure of going from, say, length is one, nesting is one, length is two, nesting is one, and so on, as well as the mixed strategy. So you're simultaneously sampling from these two different uh, sort of like structures of the data. Another really interesting section of their paper is their discussion on the hidden state allocation hypothesis. So this idea of running these, executing these Python programs or doing in, input uh, doubling, reversing with long sequences is a neural network has to perform a lot of memorization. So if you do this kind of a curriculum of, of going from uh, short digits, say length is one, so like eight up to two, like 16, you don't have to do as much memorization. And it's also likely to use the entire distributed representation. So in these uh, hidden cell states, are these vectors. And so it's likely to use the entire vector, the distribution of the vector, in order to do the easy memorization. So when it gets to harder examples, it has to completely restructure the way it's using this vector. And that's their explanation for uh, why the naive curriculum doesn't work for this setting. These are the results presenting the difference between the baseline no curriculum strategy and the combined uh, strategy where you're randomly sampling from one to A and one to B with length and nesting. And you're also sampling from this uh, growing curriculum of increasingly difficult samples. So you see, I also really like this visualization of this heat map of the accuracies. So you see how you have the dark red being the higher accuracy, and as it gets up to uh, white, it's a lower accuracy. So definitely a really nice visualization. But you see how the combined strategy outperforms on you know, nearly all of the uh, combinations of length and nesting, especially in the hardest case of nesting is four and the length of the digits is nine. We have 36% accuracy on the combined strategy and 27% on the baseline. It's also worth noting that the way that they uh, evaluate these models is they do uh, something called like teacher correction, or I forget the exact name of it, but basically if the LSTM makes a mistake on say time step T plus two, they're gonna give it the correct input in the decoder for when it's doing T plus three. So it's not quite, uh, so the errors don't compound. So if you make an error earlier, the LSTM doesn't then go and get the error it had made and continue to make errors, rather it gets the correction. So it's one way that may make these results a little bit confusing, but it still would be you know, remarkable if it was doing length is nine and nesting is four completely on its own. This plot further shows the results of the different curriculum learning strategies relative to the baseline of no curriculum. This plot shows the difference of the naive, the growing curriculum relative to the baseline. And you see the heat plot again, where the blue is actually negative, the baseline performs better. And then the red is where the uh, different curriculum learning strategy outperforms the baseline of no curriculum. So you see in the case of naive, compared to the combined strategy, the combined being where you sample from both this mixed strategy and the naive uh, distribution, and you get much more gains using this combined strategy. So it's just an interesting look at curriculum learning, which I thought was really interesting to look at and make a video about. This plot further shows the gains of doing the combined strategy compared to the baseline or either the naive or mixed curriculums with the other task of doing the input doubling, reversing, and in this case of doubling and inverting where you have a different uh, input to the uh, neural network. So in this case, you would give it the same input twice as the input to the LSTM. So it's interesting again to see this generalization of the combined strategy outperforming the naive or baseline curriculums. It's just interesting to see this uh, structure of the curriculum performing so well on both of the tasks.
Thanks for watching this video explaining the paper, Learning to Execute, a really interesting sequence-to-sequence -sequence and coder-decoder problem of learning the outputs of these Python programs without actually running the code and just predicting the output with neural networks. I thought it was really interesting their discussion of curriculum learning. We see the benefit of doing this combined strategy where you're sampling from both a progressively growing schedule of increasingly difficult samples as well as a random sample of, you know, randomly sampling from easy to hard samples. There's a really interesting paper discussing the effect of curriculum learning on an interesting problem like this. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.